Just got quiet upstairs. Uh, the drilling stopped, the pounding stopped, so I'm going to see if I can sneak this in. Uh, if not, we'll just see where it goes. Criminali did a video the other day, which I very much enjoyed, called 10 Classics That Are Actually Fun to Read. And I enjoy these kind of videos, as many people do, and I thought of 10 that weren't on his list. So after you read his 10, which are all great picks, I fully endorse, I found 10 more. And I tried to be a little obscure on some of them and try not, you know, because I've watched a lot of these videos, I'm sure you have too. I tried to pick... Some were inevitable that have been uh, seen before. I tried to pick uh, certain authors. I tried to pick a little more obscure uh, work. Let me uh, go shut that door over there. Much better. Steve Donahue who has a video of the Ten Commandments of YouTube. And, you know, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. He wasn't being mean about it, but... I, I had some great pointers from it, and it is pretty creepy to have a, an open door in the background uh, leading into the darkness so Freddy Krueger can jump out at you. Anyway, so my 10 classics, let's see, I set up some images here to show you because this is a visual medium. Although if you're like me, you're not looking at the screen right now, you're doing something else. You're browsing or scrolling or eating or and just listening anyway I have 10 works here um, I I'll be up front and say there's not that much diversity on here I would uh, strongly encourage anybody to read uh, Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights and you know many of the other books that that people often list here they're great novel by great novelists I also wish I had picked more uh, works not originally in English, not written in English, you know, more global perspective. But th these are ones that came to mind without spending all day on it. So, you know, and of course read Middlemarch, of course read all of George Eliot, of course read... Uh, Jane Eyre, as Criminali says... Anyway, let's get started here. The first one on my list is The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Also read Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. That's a very powerful book. But The Invisible Man, and I've tried to pick also ones that are free, you know, from the 19th century, older ones, although I violated that rule a couple times too. But anyway, The Invisible Man is a science fiction novel by H.G. Wells. Here's a really cool old Dell paperback cover. Looks like it's branded for their mystery series that they used to have. Uh, Dells did where they'd have maps on the back and stuff. It's a horror novel and a science fiction novel. It's a mad, it's a classic mad scientist novel. It's only uh, a little over a hundred pages in the edition I read, where this guy invents a potion that makes him invisible, and he has a lot of problems with that. You know, you know, it's an answered prayers kind of thing where, where it would be a great asset, a great superpower to have, although he's not um, able to change back and forth. And it has dire consequences. It drives, well, I'm giving away too much. Okay, so that's one. I'm going to try and go a little faster because I don't want this to be that long. All right, what have I got next? Okay. The Three Musketeers. I could have said The Count of Monte Cristo, but this book is off the hook. This is one of the most entertaining books you'll ever read. It could have been written yesterday as a historical novel. It is action-packed, scene by scene, great story. Uh, one thing you'll you'll find about a lot of the all of these books I mentioned is they've all been adapted many many times. In fact, I had to scroll for twenty minutes to find a copy of a book uh, instead of a Three Musketeers screenshot from a movie. It's just wonderful. Don't sleep on that. Read this book if you like adventure and excitement and thrills and chills. The next one, 
uh, used to be assigned in school. I think even when when people read it in school, they do enjoy it. It's, a, it's another pretty short book, The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. It's about a young man who uh, is a either a draftee or a volunteer private in the Union Army. In his first battle, he gets scared, runs away, and he and the rest of the book, the short book is about him trying to deal with the shame of that, and he goes back into his second battle as the flag carrier, the flag bearer for his regiment, and it's very vividly written. It's, um, I looked this up to confirm it. Famously, Stephen Crane w was not a soldier. He was only about five when the Civil War ended. He had been a war correspondent, though, in a couple of different conflicts. And the reason that comes up a lot with this book especially is it's so vivid and so realistic that you think it would have to be written by a soldier. But it was a very powerful novel, uh, very realistic, and uh, you know the pace is just uh, relentless. Okay, so next one I picked is the Aspern Papers by Henry James. And Henry James, I had a couple choices there too. He's a, a, a novelist, not very popular among parts of uh, Booktube. He is a little dry. Probably the most popular thing to pick would be The Turn of the Screw, his ghost story, which is excellent. Also, I considered uh, picking Daisy Miller, which is even shorter than The Aspern Papers. But the Aspen Papers is, has a lot of aspects of a thriller. It's about a guy who is a, a, a literary scholar who worships the work of this, this man named Aspern who's recently died. And he goes to Aspern's estate in Italy to try and scam his way in to, the, to Aspern's his surviving uh, paramour, mistress, or whatever you would call her. You know, or his, his the woman he lived with late in his life, and trying to ingratiate with him himself with her and, and another woman in in the the family to try and get access to Aspern's papers, his his final manuscripts, his letters, and things like that for an autobiography autobiography he wants to write, and it's just very vividly told. It's it does read like a thriller. I might have said that already. Um, because of the machinations, it doesn't quite, you know, have the same conclusion as a thriller. It it, it is a very uh, entertaining story, though. Let's see what's next. I don't want to get too far out of order here. But kind of been skipping around. Ollie on his uh, list included uh, Lolita uh, by Nabokov, and I thought along those lines I would include something a little more modern too, and it's some and something. As, in the same general vein of transgressive uh, literature and you know a bit more shocking than some of the others on this list and I have chosen uh, Yukio Mishima's The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea this was made into a movie with without any Japanese people in it uh, once uh, a Chris Christopherson movie in the 70s I think this was written about 65 I just looked it up before I started the video but it's a story of a a some weird ass kids, especially one weird ass kid, and his sort of fixation on the lover of his mother, who's a sailor, and and he goes in a very mission. Could be a very twisted writer. It's very it's very creepy and bizarre. If you like weird, creepy kid stories, I would recommend that. It's very short. Uh, another one by Mishima that's probably in the same vein that's also short is The Temple of the Golden Pavilion. Um, okay, so now we're going, in, as long as we're in weird stuff, here's a great horror novel written around the same time as Dracula. Many people, uh, you know, acknowledge that Dracula is a great read. Here's another one and much shorter. Uh, the Picture of Dorian Gray, again, been made into a movie a couple times. It's only about 200 pages long, I think, by Oscar Wilde. I believe it's his only straightforward uh, novel. 
it's a fantasy story about a young man named Dorian Gray and his circle of like effete, esthete, uh, you know, bright young things in, in, in late 19th century England, London. And, you know, people probably know this much. If anything, he, he has a portrait painted and the portrait starts to pay the price for all his debauchery, all his drinking, all his lecturing, all the things he does in his life doesn't show on his face, it shows on the portrait. And you can see where that goes if you read the book. Here is one of my favorite writers, I'm always talking about her on this channel, Edith Wharton. I almost picked Ethan Frome because it's one of her shorter books. This is The Custom of the Country, it's not long. Uh, Ethan Frome is, is, is a really good story about a love triangle, but it's 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 rural New England. It really doesn't uh, give the... It's really kind of an outlier in Edith Wharton's work, I think, at least compared to what I've read. This is more along the lines of, of what her major work is, and it's... What's the name of this character? Oh, Lily Bart. This is the story of Lily Bart who's about 29 years old, coming to the end of her ability to marry up, which she desperately wants to do, and it's her, her, her machinations moving through society. So it's uh, very much, if you like any sort of uh, intrigue, social intrigue kind of uh, plots, social climbing, you know, different, difference in class, people trying to get ahead, you know, that kind of thing, it's really... A great read too. I recommend that. Let's see what else. Am I at ten yet? Um, all her books, all Edith Wharton's books, are incredible. Her characters are so vivid. And if you have to choose between reading Henry James and Edith Wharton, because many times they cover the same kind of area, definitely pick Wharton. Okay, then this here is a Mark Twain novel called Puddinghead Wilson. Probably not his most famous novel. I wonder if everybody's even really heard of it. It has a lot of different elements in it. It involves, like, The Prince and the Pauper, which I read by Twain last month. This book also employs the trope, the theme of uh, infants switched. Uh, well, I guess in Prince and the Pauper, they're not switched at birth, but this is about... Uh, two children who look very much alike who get switched at birth. One is one thirty-second Afri Afri African American, black, so he's uh, would be considered second-class citizen in the era of this of this pre and uh, I think it's antebellum. Oh man, I don't remember now. Okay, well anyway, it's either yeah, I think it's antebellum South, or it might be just after the Civil War. Uh, switched in with a person of privilege. Anyway, Puddinghead Wilson grows up thinking he is part African American. He is called Puddinghead. He is a lawyer. He goes to a, a new town, and he, he people get the impression he's dumb because he's actually really smart. But he says something so over their heads they think he must be an idiot, so they call him Puddinghead, and they don't respect him. And he has a terrible law practice. Uh, he has a goofy. Uh, Obsession, which comes into play later in the novel, it's kind of like uh, this is kind of like a, um, in one sense it's, it's a social novel and it's got a lot of humor in it, and it's also kind of a legal thriller, and kind of a and it, it involves a at that time very new technology, so it's well worth a read. Let me see what else I've got. I've got. Uh-oh, did I lose one? Okay. Now, uh, Ollie didn't uh, didn't recommend any Dickens books. He recommended uh, Wilkie Collins, which is a very good pick. Uh, he doesn't like Dickens. Uh, uh, along with people not liking that I'm finding on my, among my booktube friends uh, a dislike of Henry James, I also find one, a dislike of uh, Dickens by a lot of people. I don't know. So maybe this won't work for you. Your mileage may vary. My first instinct was to pick A Christmas Carol. Uh, I didn't because that's pretty short. Plus, you already know the story and you might have even read it. 
This is my favorite Dickens novel, and I have not read every single novel. I think I've read all the major ones except for uh, the legal one. What's that called? Bleak House. Great Expectations, another clue about how great this story is, is there's about a billion and a half adaptations of it. This, this starts with a young man named Pip. That's his nickname. Uh, as an orphan, as you might be able to guess from there. reason I picked this cover, even though this is uh, some small kind of uh, uh, mock-up somebody did themselves or some uh, sm small press did, is all the, other, all, all the other covers make this book look dull. No wonder people don't like it. Anyway, uh, it's, it's about his, his, his career, his great expectations, so to speak, which is a, a title that has many different meanings, two of the most be, being uh, great things are expected of him, great things are expected uh, for him by different people, by different mentors he has. Starts out, he's, he gets terrified. Uh, he's in the uh, graveyard mourning his parents. He lives like many Dickens characters with, uh, with unfriendly relatives. And uh, this character, an escaped convict, convict called Magwitch, terrifies him. The novel's broken up into some different uh, eras. So we skip ahead after this Magwitch episode, so, which is very... Uh, exciting and thrilling in its in its own right. We skip to another part of, of Pip's life where he comes into contact with a woman named Miss Haversham, who is one of the strangest characters in Dickens and one of the strangest characters in all of 19th century fiction. She is a woman who was left at the altar many years ago and refuses to clean up or change the decorations in the house, you know, to, to clear away the wedding feast plans, to, to change out for a wedding dress. So she's wearing this rotten old, once white gray wedding dress. She has a girl there in her care and she is looking for someone, she tells a mentor of Pips that she wants a, a boy to visit her and, uh, you know, a polite boy to visit her. And that's Pip, and he starts going to the house. And he meets her, and he meets the, the young girl who lives there. And I won't give any, way, any more away than that. It goes a long ways from that. Like I say, it is not, this is not a short novel by any means. It's shorter than some of Dickens' longer novels, but um, it is just such a powerful story. And the and what some of the characters in the background are up to in this story, especially Miss Haversham, regarding uh, Pip, is just mind-boggling. It's just really powerful storytelling. So, if anybody who's had a trouble with Dickens before, give that one a shot before you give up. I would think. I know a lot of people, uh, and I almost uh, myself. Uh, Suggest that Oliver Twist, which is either his first, either Dickens' first or second novel, depending on if you count the Pickwick Papers as a actual novel instead of a kind of a pastoral collection of adventures. But Oliver Twist, I think, kind of moves kind of slow. It is shorter and it has a good story, and you probably know it from the movie and that kind of thing. But it doesn't really move, and Great Expectations is one of his later novels, and it really is a masterpiece. So that's my push for that. One more to go, I think, unless I miscounted, and that is the classic, the original classic. Unless you want to count Odyssey, you could read the Odyssey instead, but the Iliad of Homer. Uh, here's a prose translation, and I, I put this up here just to remind myself that there are prose translations. So I'm anticipating uh, the big objection to this being uh, it's a poem. So my my clue on that is just don't read it as a poem. Read it as a novel. There are prose translations. But they're kind of dry, though. I don't know if there's been a recent one. I think they're kind of out of fashion to do prose translations. Read it. Don't end stopped. 
Don't End Stop. And that is for people who don't know, and I, I, other people, it doesn't matter. You can log off now because you already know not to do this if you love poetry. But end stopping is when you read and you stop at the end of the line and you end up with this kind of sing-song reading in your mind where you're breaking off at the end of the line. Read through, read through the verse, read through the lines like you're reading prose. Stop at commas, stop at periods, stop at breaks like that. Don't stop at the end. Don't get into a rhythm of reading a line. da 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 Then it'll turn into sing-song and you won't like it as much. Just read it like a novel. Think of it as a novel with really wide margins. You can get a prose copy, like I said, and then you have to read like normal size margins, or you can read it like a nice little column of text. The Iliad I picked instead of the Odyssey, they're both good. Uh, and the Odyssey is shorter, but the Iliad I picked is it's, uh, it's more of an external story in that uh, it's a war story. It's not the entire history of the Trojan War. In fact, I should have downloaded it, but I saw one, one cover had a picture of the Trojan horse on the Iliad, which is hilarious because the Trojan horse story, which uh, you know is part of the, 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 the War of, of Troy, the Achaeans versus Troy, is not part of this story because this is a very specific novel. The Iliad is about Achilles and the wrath of Achilles, which is the first sentence about uh, about this story, which tells you this story is about the wrath of Achilles, who is so mad because he is mistreated by his king, by the the over the overall general leader of the the Greek forces in Troy. Uh, he's slighted, and I won't go into the reasons why. I let you enjoy that. That he refuses to fight, which is a problem because he Achilles is the hero. He is the greatest hero. His his participation in the war will make or break the war. If he doesn't fight, they won't win. If he does fight, they might win. And his adversary among the Trojans is Ajax, who's the hero, his equivalent among the Trojans. So most of the novel is, is, is Achilles uh, refusing to fight because of the way he's been treated by his allies and eventually coming into the conflict, conflict between himself and Ajax. And so it starts 10 years, like I said, into the war. The war's been going on 10 years when the book starts. So they're already at their last, on their last nerve, 10 years on the beach trying to, trying, trying to break the walls of the city of Troy. It's a great novel, it's a great war story, it's a great human story, it's a great story of, of giant passions, you know, overarching passions that people have to find either how to control or, or to uh, consume them. So I recommend giving that a read too. I wanted to keep this to 10 minutes, we're at 23 minutes. So I will see you next time.